Sometimes we start with prayer. Sometimes we don't. But tonight, I want you to pray with me that the Lord begin to bring his truth out the way he wants to. Amen? And that we not judge it. If there's something about it you don't understand, please put it on the shelf. And later when you can, get your concordance, study it out, research it out. Amen? I'm going to talk to you when I get into the Word here in a few minutes. I want to talk to you about the sincere milk of the Word. <coughs> We have had people in our circles in times past that uh, would make such statements as, uh, I've killed the cow. In other words, uh, we no longer operate with the milk of the word. And what they did is, uh, is they stopped themselves in their position of eliteness from uh, being able to allow a further fulfilling of the truth of God's Word. Amen? Amen. Uh, because it's, it's very necessary since, since milk is, a, uh, is for babies more or less, uh, why is it for babies? because it's easy to be entreated. In other words, it's, uh, uh, the babies aren't developed to where they can stand stronger food, amen? amen, and solid food. Well, it's the same thing when it comes to the gospel that Jesus has put in this book. There's times when uh, I don't care what level you're at. If you're in the race, and you're looking towards the mark, the prize of the high calling of God. There's going to come times to, uh, to when uh, he's going to want to bring you into another level of truth or another level of the Spirit. And uh, uh, it's, called, it's called being born again, being birthed by the Spirit. A lot of people think that it's just a one-time deal. You're born again, and Christ uh, Jesus comes into your heart and life, and that's it. No more birthings. No, that's not the way it is. Every time that you reach another level in Him, there literally is a, another birthing that takes place. And when you come into this level, He will have to break it down for you and make it so simple that, uh, and if you'll look, uh, let's see for me, I believe in, uh, in the book of James. I'll turn there or get somebody to turn there. That uh, knowledge is power, is it not? And more knowledge is uh, more power. But without, uh, without wisdom, what happens to power? It's not effective because without the wisdom to how to operate in the power of it, uh, it's, uh, it's useless. But if, if you're given the wisdom to know how to operate, amen, amen. Then, then the power is very wonderful and very useful. In the book of James... I believe it's in the, uh, I believe it's in the third chapter, and uh, yeah, let's just start there. That's a good place to start, Sister Reva. We'll start in the 13th verse. Who is a wise man and endured with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. 
This kind of wisdom is descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. Amen? Now, here I want to, in the 17th verse, I want to show you the sincere milk of the word. But wisdom that is from above is first pure. Say pure. pure. Doesn't have any mixture in it. True wisdom is when God reveals to you the meaning of his gospel, the meaning of his word, the revelation, or it's the revelation or the unveiling of himself. And uh, it has no mixture in it. The reason there's no mixture in it is because man can't reveal him. Amen. He has to reveal himself. And there's no mixture. He has no hidden agenda. He has no, uh, no strife or, or nothing in it. He's not mad at anybody. And there is absolutely no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk after the Spirit and not the flesh. Amen? Amen. So uh, the first thing about wisdom is man ain't got it. It's not in man. Now, we got scripture for that in where? Job? We do have. If we had time and this was the message, all the message, I'd go there. Where wisdom come from. Ear hasn't heard it, eye hasn't seen it, nor has it entered into the heart of man. The things that God has planned and purposed for those that love him. Amen? So, it's pure. Then it's peaceable. Practical. It's peaceable. It'll tell you that he died for you. He went to Calvary for you. He's come by his spirit now and entered into life with you. And great peace have those whose mind has stayed on him. Amen? Amen. Makes it very practical, very understandable. And uh, it's gentle. And listen to this. Easy to be entreated. There's your sincere, sincere milk of the word. Easy to be entreated. It's not complicated. He breaks it down. Amen? Hallelujah. Thank, and thank God he does. And uh, it's full of mercy good fruits. It's without partiality, without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown of peace of them that make peace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, last Wednesday night, I literally, when I begin to deal with the various names of, of the city of God, and, of course, the church is the city of God. Amen? And uh, the Lord Jesus is in the very midst of his body, his temple, his city, his church. And the various names that were involved. Uh, one of the names is Jerusalem, city of peace. Amen? Another name for Jerusalem was, uh, was Ariel. He says, I will distress Ariel. Put up forts against Ariel. In other words, uh, uh, and I'm going to quote you a scripture now out of Revelation where he talks to us about counseling. He says, my counsel to thee, he says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that you may be rich, and white raiment, be clothed with white raiment, that you, that you may be righteous. Amen? And I said that uh, on your eyes that you might see enlightenment as many as I love as many as I love he does what chastises and rebukes and I looked that word up and uh, it really doesn't fit the way we believe a rebuke is it's just it's just correction amen and adjustments on things uh, especially attitudes attitude adjustments and this sort of thing I've never ever had God just rebuke, rebuke me, never. But he certainly straightened me out on some matters. <laughs> that's, 
Well, in a sense, yeah. yeah. But rebuke, so many people take it as, oh, God, you know, he just zapped me. He's just going to zap me. No, he's going to instruct you. And he's going to talk to you about what he likes versus what you like and what his will is and purpose in and destiny is versus what you think it is. Amen? Amen. And that's what he's talking about. And so with that in mind, I, I shotgunned some things out, and I, I couldn't believe I was going where I was going and some of the shotgun things that I put out there. I, I totally was out of control. I mean, the way I, you know, wanted to be in control. I like to be in control. I don't really like for him to bypass me sometimes. <laughs> I want to be in union with him. <coughs> but we talked about, and I'm just going to put it like this. Uh, there is a corruption. And uh, if you really studied out and took a good look at uh, 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, it talks about how this mortal or this mortal must put on immortality and this corruption must put on incorruption. And so we were talking about uh, the 120th Psalm. And in this 120th Psalm, uh, I just kind of shotgun some things out. But tonight I want to break it down. Amen? Some of you understand it. Some of you have been there and heard it before. Some of you researched it out. Maybe some of you haven't. So if you'll turn with me to the 120th Psalm, I want to deal with this. Hopefully the way the Lord wants to deal with it. Praise God. If I can find it. 114. And the 19th, 119th goes forever, doesn't it? Here we are. I'm going to try to break this down. And in a little bit, I'm going to, uh, since the word sincere only shows up twice in the entire Bible, and the sincere milk of the word is in First Peter, and we're going to have to go there, being born of that incorruptible seed. Amen? And so uh, here in uh, this 120th Psalm, he says, In my distress I cried unto the Lord, and he heard me. Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue. What shall be given unto thee, or what shall be done unto thee, thou false tongue? And uh, the answer to what's to be given to the false tongue. Now, what is a false tongue? A false tongue uh, has to do with out of the abundance of the heart, wherever you want to think the heart is, the mouth speaks. And I'm going to show you something about uh, here in this, in this uh, little 120th Psalm about why it speaks negative, how, why it speaks in fear, why it speaks in doubt. Uh, and, and, and why these things are, and then the answer to how God can correct it or change it and bring it in, because you on your own cannot tame an unruly tongue, can you? Amen. Man can't tame it. So only God can. But you've got to know how he does it. Amen? Because he's going to do it with you. Amen? That's how he's going to do it. But I want to break it down so far down that there ain't no doubt about how he does it and how you can let it happen. Amen? And so this little 120 psalm sure gives, psalm gives us an insight into it. It says, What shall be given unto thee, or what shall be done unto thee, thou false tongue? Now remember in Isaiah 28, last week, we talked about those scornful men that ruled as people in Jerusalem. And we dealt somewhat with Jerusalem and all the names of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Ariel. Uh, it's also, uh, it's also uh, 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 Milo. Ramparts, or where it's ramped up. Uh, uh, there's various names, and each name has a meaning. 
Ariel means the lion of the tribe of Judah. Amen? It's a lion of the, it's a lion. Each name has a character and has a nature to it. Amen? Jerusalem, city of peace. But Ariel is the lion. Amen? I, I, I got to do this this way. If I don't do it this way, I'll get so far out of track. So I'm going to get my notebook. Ariel is line of God, strength of God. It's the burning place of God. God's a consuming fire, so it's a burning place. We're going to deal right here about the coals of juniper. And uh, it's a place of God, and it's the also the altar of God. Amen? Well, we know that in God's temple, which house you are, which temple you are, there's an altar. Amen? And that's uh, that represents the place of sacrifice where you've given up your life to him. Amen? Amen? And so it's a place of sacrifice. And then uh, uh, goes on to another name, Jubus. And Jubus, there was a stronghold uh, in the in the top of the city of David, that uh, the, in, in the, what was called in the city of David, it's another name, city of David. Uh, and there was a place called Jubas, or the Jubasites were there. Now the Jubasites wouldn't allow any anything that was blind or lame to come into it. And uh, and so by their religion and their beliefs. Uh, David didn't pay any attention to it, and he went ahead and, uh, and uh, conquered them anyway. Amen? Now, David doesn't like the blind or the lame, but the blind is just simply uh, a place to where uh, we're going to look at here in 120th Psalm, a place of Kedar. The lame is just simply those walking out a different gospel. Amen? And if they're lame... They really can't run this race correctly. And so what do we got to do with the lame? Get them healed. Amen? Amen? And the blind, we've got to open up the blind eyes that we may see. Or the darkness, get it out of the way. All right? And so the Jubasites, or the name Jubas, was also a city of Jerusalem, city of Jubas. Jubas is trodden down, trampled, under feet, a threshing floor. And uh, a threshing floor is when uh, you got the good grain, amen, but it's got chaff in it, it's got uh, dust in it, what have you. Uh, and uh, and when, when on a threshing floor, they don't run a cart on it, they, they thresh it with what? A rod. What's a rod? It's a scepter. It's the ability of God to be able to uh, toss it about and then the wind of the Spirit blow away the shaft and all those impurities there and what you've got left is the pure word or the pure grain. Amen? So it's a threshing floor. It's conquered. It's subjected. It's utterly subdued. Uh, laid waste. It's profound. It's, pro it's polluted. Uh, it's, it's the sense and carnal thoughts or beliefs and desires or eras. So God's going to deal with eras. He's going to deal with carnal thoughts. He's going to deal with, with everything that's in, involved with these things that are here in the 120th Psalm. I just wanted to read those things. Uh, also, another name was Milo, which is just another name for uh, where, where, where David ramped up and fortified the, the, the hill there called Mount Zion. Amen? Another name. So we have all kinds of names for who we are. But there's a nature connected with every one of them. Now this 120th Psalm, we're here, he says uh, in uh, the third verse, What shall be given unto thee, or what shall be done unto thee, thou false tongue? And here's the answer that is given. Sharp arrows of the mighty with coals of juniper. 
a sharp arrow, and God said he set his bow in the cloud. And a bow, uh, when, when he has a ministry set in the body of apostles, prophets, pastors, and ancient teachers, then they are able to, uh, with his ability given to them, to shoot these arrows out of the bow, and these, are, these will pierce down, way down into what the problem really is. And the problem really is, is, uh, is and I'm going to read it here in this next verse and get back to it uh, on the sharp arrows. For my soul, I mean, uh, uh, where am I at? Fourth verse. Sharp arrows of the mighty and coals of juniper. Woe is me, fifth verse now, woe is me that I sojourn in Meshach and that I dwell in the tents of Kedar. And I, I've preached this before and studied it before, and I've looked up the word Meshach, and I just brought it out last week without really telling you where I got it, how I got it, and what it really means in the in depth of it. But I brought it out like this. It's perceptibility that's not perceivable. Amen? But when you look it up in the concordance, the original Hebrew word for Meshach, I, I've, I've got it. I want to deal with it a little bit because I want to get this crystal clear, if I possibly can. I've got to have some of my notes that I did. So, in the uh, concordance, it gives you a number of uh, 4902. It simply says in 4902 that Meshach, uh, the same in form as 4901, but uh, probably of or for uh, uh, Meshach, a son. He's the son of Japheth, and the and the people that are descendant from him. So Meshach is a tribe of people. Amen? And uh, then uh, 4901, Meshach, is a, uh, is a sowing, also a possession, uh, which is highly prized. Amen? And so uh, uh, then it goes back to 4900. From uh, anointed, no, no, I'll get this 4,900. Meshach, a prime root, to draw, used in a great variety of applications, including to sow, uh, to sound, to prolong, to develop, to march. One of the things that David, in talking to uh, the Lord about going into battle against the Philistines, is as he inquired about how he was to go, whether he was to go directly to him, and the Lord said, no, you're going to come around and compass him around behind by the mulberry trees. Amen? And in the mulberry trees, when you hear the sound of the going, G-O-I-N-G, that's when you go. And when you look up the word going there, uh, I know you think it's the wind blowing the mulberries, but what it was, it was a sound of marching, military sound. Amen? God's people is a great army. And any time you're marching, you're in a movement. You're, you're going forward. You're moving. Amen? So it's talking about the move of God, and there's a marching going on. This is all involved with this word Meshach and the, mani and the meaning of it. It's uh, to march, to remove, to delay, to be tall. Amen? But the primary word here, uh, uh, give, handle, make, the primary word actually boils down to, here's what happens. And we'll go to this definition of where I got it for the perceptibility that's not perceivable. I have a... Uh, 
I have a metaphysical dictionary, all the names in the Bibles. And sometimes I find it uh, uh, very, very interesting. I made copies of, well, I've got Sincere here, and I've got Kedar here. To where is my? It's on the other side. Okay, now this is the, this is the Meshach. It's a perceptibility, perceptible cause distinguished from prime cause, which is not perceivable. Meditative, uh, conceptuous, and drawing out and deducting, or deducing, when you want to put it. The subconscious in us is what controls us. It's programmed from the time you're a baby till you're grown, through whatever schooling, whatever high school, college, grade school, whatever, whatever schooling you've been through. Your parents, all the things in the family, and then the things in the world. It's, it's all that's programmed, that's subconscious. Now you and I, we have no control over over our heart pumping, do we? We can't make it stop. We can't make it start, can we? We can run real fast and make it go faster. But if we sit down and stop for a little bit, it'll, it'll calm down, will it not? So everything about the subconscious is controlled by spirit. And uh, in the subconscious now, uh, uh, if, if, you're, uh, if you're like I am, let's say I'm a trained, uh, I'm a trained salesman. The way I got my training was through practical applications on the job. I didn't get it through schooling in a school. I got it through training on a job. And I learned how to handle people, handle deals, and buy and sell automobiles and do all the things that I do. And so that well, was all programmed in me. And so what you do when, you're, when your tongue or when your mouth, you speak out of the abundance of your heart, your heart is also part of your heart is that subconscious that's been programmed there. So you're going to sow with the seed of your mouth and your tongue what's in there. Amen. If there's doubt, you're going to sow doubt. If there's fear, you're going to sow it. Amen? If there's frustration, you'll sow it. If there's anger, you'll certainly sow that. And all the things that are in that subconscious that's been programmed there, you'll sow that. That's what you bring out of your heart. That's what you bring out of your subconscious. That's what you bring out of your mind. And if it's programmed with error, you know what you're going to bring? You're going to sow error. Believing it to be the absolute truth because somebody preached it, somebody taught it, or you heard it somewhere. And uh, even though it sounded good and it was a great fable and it was absolutely beautiful and you've taken it to be true, what if it's error? Now the wisdom that comes from the spirit doesn't have any mixture in it because, see, in the subconscious, there's all kinds of mixture. There's mixed thoughts. There's uh, mixed doctrines. There's all sorts of things. Like the guy said, I killed a cow. In other words, I got off of the sincere milk of the word. I'm now, I'm now a mature or an elitist. He didn't call himself an elitist, but I certainly put that handle on him. And he wasn't the only one like that. And that's just simply pride. That's taken out of the subconscious what you believe to be true without getting the true wisdom which is easy to be entreated. Amen? So we go on on the right page here. Uh, son of Japheth, uh, 1 Chronicles 1 17, Mash, the son of uh, uh, Aram, uh, is called Meshach. Meshach is mentioned in Ezekiel 27 13 with Tubal and, and Javelin, two other sons of Japheth, now who was the son of, of, of uh, Noah. Amen? And. Uh, uh, there the names, no doubt, refer to countries or to tribes of people descended from these men and called by their name. 
Uh, also see Ezekiel 38, 2 and 1. Now the metaphysical is like this. Perception through the senses, including according to appearances, what you see with the natural eye instead of what you see with the spirit. Amen? And, uh, and so it's uh, uh, through the senses, including according to appearances, the work of the mind in its drawing of conclusions and in conceiving ideas. It's perceptibility. Part of the word of perceptibility is perceiving something. Amen? And when God wants you to perceive something, he's going to open up the eyes of your understanding and make it easy for you to understand it. Doesn't make it complicated. Uh, I know there's a lot of mystery involved, but what his whole, what his whole desire is is to show you the mystery. Once you've got a mystery. Now, what's in my right, right pocket? See, they're close to me, and they can tell. It's, it's keys in my hand. See, there was three things in my hand and the keys <laughs> and the change. But once I show it to you, you know what's there. See? So that's the idea about revelation is showing the mystery of a thing. Amen? Now, it says here that uh, in this fifth word, Woe is me, talking about the tongue, that I sojourn in Meshach. And that I dwell in the tents of Kedar. Now, Kedar, I've got on the other side. And uh, Kedar is, uh, uh, is, it's a Hebrew word, turbid, dirty, dusky, dark colored, dark skinned, obscure, overcast, black, mournful, and sorrowful. If there's sorrow in there, you're going to sow sorrow. If there's no peace, then uh, you're going to gripe and you're complain about this or that or everything else. You're not satisfied to be in his likeness and in his image. Why? Because you don't have that likeness and image that's been reprogrammed to those born again to where you have that confidence that you have perfect peace. Amen? Well, praise God. And so, uh, uh, son of Ishmael and the, and, the, and the name of an, an Arabian tribe that he founded, and a metaphysical is confused, unsettled, disturbed, obscurity, thought, obscure thought, uh, yet one with a degree of power that belongs to the outer senses, uh, those of consciousness in man. This, this, uh, this concept is darkened by materiality, yet for a time it brings forth substance from the Bible reference to Kedar. We gather that the, the tribe must have been both wealthy and powerful through its uh, downfall, was, though its downfall was prophesied. Only that which is of joy, gladness, and clearness of vision, that which is of God, that which is consciously founded in spirit will stand the test and will abide. Amen? So I wanted to give you the definition of Meshach, Kedar. Back into the fourth verse, sharp arrows of the mighty with coals of juniper. I'm going to still deal some more with this uh, sharp arrows of the mighty. In the, in, in the definition of, of the subconscious, God called it uh, a hardened heart. Amen? Or a stony heart. One that believes the way it believes and, and, and is not open to any new revelation. Amen? And so many times that's the case. And so what does it take? It takes a sharp arrow or the Word of God that's quick and powerful. And it divides us under soul, spirit, moral, and what? Bone and marrow. Uh, is a discerner of the thoughts and intent of what? The heart. Or that in-depth or that place of that subconscious. The Word of God is quick and powerful. 
And so what has to happen is the old stony heart has to be removed. Amen? And there has to be a heart transplant. Now the sharp arrows are the Word of God that comes in and pierces right down to every little thing in there that's contrary to the presence of God living in a tabernacle, living in a temple, living in a city, living in a body. Amen? And the, 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 the Word of God is, ante is antiseptic. Is that the right word? It's pure. <coughs> it'll come in there, and it'll give you a sedative that will help you to understand what's going on. Amen? Isaiah 28 will tell you what he's getting ready to do. When the overflowing scourge comes, it'll come morning by morning, night by night. Amen? And we know that Jesus, when he walked into the temple, uh, where they were, uh, the, they were uh, doing exchanges and stuff with the money and all this, and he walked in there, and he had a little scourge he'd made, a whip. And he come in, and he drove out everything out of the temple, saying to them, My house shall be a house of prayer or communication, where I can communicate with them, they can communicate with me. And we're not going to have the thievery and the, and the wrong attitude in my father's house. Hello, house. Amen. He's not going to have in your house those things that are contrary to him. So he's going to come in with sharp arrows and penetrate down there and give you a sedity. And through the skill then of, of those that he set in the body, the ministry that he set in the body that are taught and brought to the place to where they have the skills of where they can come down into there and get right down into where you live, where the rubber hits the road, praise God, and they can absolutely begin to do the operation with the sword of the Spirit and remove that old stony heart. At the same time, they're going to come back in there, and they're not going to just leave that thing the way it is. They're going to put something in there, praise God, that is not contrary to God. They're going to put in a soft, pliable heart, one that God can deal with, praise God, and one that will be like him in nature and character. Amen. Sharp arrows of the mighty with the coals of juniper. Now, coals... Speaks for itself. <coughs> when I was a boy, this was in the 30s, <coughs> early 40s, my job, one of my jobs was to get up in the morning and put some kindling on the fire, put some fresh coal in the stove, put some kindling on it, and light the stove. Now, the wood would burn real quick, but the coals, you see, it had to have a hot fire for the coals to get on fire. But then they would burn for a long time. But there's a byproduct. What is it? Ashes. Another one of my jobs was not only did I have to go carry the coal and get it in there and put it in there, I had to get into that stove and get out and get the ashes. And undoubtedly, I would spill some of them. So the juniper here is the juniper tree. Uh, the tree itself speaks of righteousness, but it also speaks of what God's doing the right way. Uh, it's, it's a tree that they make, with the bristles on it, they make brooms out of. And, of course, the brooms will sweep away all the refuse of lies. Look in Isaiah 28. The hail will sweep away the refuse of lies. There's some sweeping has to be done. Now, I found out that when I did this job one day that there was another day. And when the other day, when the next day rolled around, I had to do it again. And then there was another day, and I had to do it again. And so it's line upon line. It's precept upon precept. It's here a little, there a little. God's working both in and to do and, and in you to do of his own will and his own purpose. And he never stops. He never slows down. When he talks about the overflowing scourge, it comes morning by morning, day by day. You can't stop it. It's an overflowing river of scourge or correction. Amen? Amen. And about the time you think you've arrived, maybe you've killed a cow. Uh, the bed will be too short for you. Covering you can't quite wrap yourself in. You'll never get fully comfortable. 
Amen. Until he deals with you with a sincere milk of the word. I, I got to go there. If I don't go there, let's go into First Peter. I'm just going to read a few scriptures. Just kind of read along with me. I'm going to start. I'm going to start in the, in the latter part of the first chapter. Uh, and, and read something, then come back to it. Uh, 21st, second verse. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth of the Spirit unto unfeigned or unnatural love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Without a pure heart, you can't do that. Hence the heart transplant. And uh, being born again, 23rd verse, being born again, not of a corruptible seed, but of an incorruptible by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. Goes on down to the 25th. The word of God endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Now let's go back up into the first part of the chapter. And he's not talking about just being born again one time. Amen. Well, look at it. What does it say? Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. Can you take on the entire Bible of God in one week, one month, one year? No. See, so there has to be many birthings to do away with the incorruptible and put in the, or the corruptible and, and put in the incorruptible. Now let's go back over to the first part of it. It said, uh, third verse, blessed be the be God the Father of our Lord Jesus which according to his uh, abundant mercy hath begotten us again does that say again in your Bible he's begotten us again well maybe he's begotten us again right here tonight amen praise God he's got begotten us again uh, uh, unto a lively or a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. What is the dead? Those that are separated from God. If you're no longer separated from God and you're, you're one in union with you, you're alive. You have life working. Amen? Amen? And so it's to an inheritance that's incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away. It's reserved in heaven for you. Reserved. Where's it at? Where's heaven? Anywhere God is. God's presence. In this little church here tonight, we're having a visitation from God. Because God is presence, and that visitation is here. We're in a heavenly position or a heavenly place in Him. And so what's reserved for you and I, He is no longer keeping it back, it's available to you. It's not reserved any longer. Amen? Amen? You can have it. It's yours. You can possess it. It's my good pleasure to give you the kingdom and the power and the glory of it. Amen? Amen. I want you to prosper being health as your soul prospers. Amen? God wants you to absolutely <coughs> reach out uh, for the mark and the prize of the high calling to where you can be holy like he is holy. You can be perfect like he's perfect. Don't let that word throw you. This means complete. Or unionize with him. Amen? Amen. Praise God. That well, it does. But <laughs> as Chuck said, <laughs> he's perfect. <laughs> but it's, it's not a word. You, because so many people think that perfect is unattainable. It's not. Amen. You can attain it. You can possess that which is perfect because the word of God's perfect. It's pure. Amen. And you can possess the knowledge of it, the understanding of it, and the power of it, and the glory of it. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Okay. To an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Well, what's, what's wrong with this time? 
And see, every time we get to a last time, we know there's another time around the corner. And we go into another time. There's no limits. Praise God. This has been going on for a long, long, long time. It ain't stopping. That's right. The more you grow, the more you learn, the more you grow. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations or testings. But look, here's what God has to say about it. That the trial of your faith being much more valuable or precious than, a, than of gold that perish, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus, whom having not seen, you love, and whom though now you see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Searching what or might manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ at the glory that should follow. Now I'm going to jump because of time into the second chapter, or third chapter, second chapter. Okay, second chapter, starting with the first verse. Wherefore, laying aside all malice, all guile, I should deal with guile, I'm not tonight, and hypocrisies and envyings and all evil speaking, what comes out of your mouth, that tongue, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. If so be, if so be you have tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom coming is unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also, as lively or living stones, are built up as a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. They're not accepted unless they're spiritual sacrifice. Your prayer's not getting answered. They're not being used as a spiritual sacrifice. You're not understanding that you're a spiritual house. And you got that way through the sincere milk of the Word. Yeah. Amen? Now, I want to deal a little bit here with you on this sincere. I don't have much time left. Let's see where I got it. Okay. That's not it, and that's not it. So it must be here. Does everybody know what sincere means? Are you sure? Hmm? How about if I read for you uh, out of the dictionary? That work? Okay, let's go to the sincere milk of the word. Let's, let's talk about this, about this word sincere. All right, out of the dictionary, Webster's Dictionary or World Dictionary, whatever I've got is a World Dictionary, I guess. It's a, uh, number one, fine number one. Without deceit, uh, precious, Sincere, sincerely, or uh, uh, clean, pure, uh, without deceit, uh, pretense, or hypocrisy, truthful, straightforward, honest, in its desire to help. Being the same in actual, in actual uh, character, as in outward appearance, genuine, real, not archaic. Amen? Sincere implies an absence of deceit, pretense, or hypocrisy, and an adherence to the simple, unembellished truth and desire to help. Unaffected implies a natural 
genuine sincerity. Amen? Just being real. Just being real. And so that's the way, that's what the sincere milk of the word is. It's like this. It's real truth. Amen? It's breaking, breaking it down. Getting the full understanding of the sharp arrows. Full understanding of, of, <coughs> of, of the coals, the fire, the purging, the burning of the fire, and then the sweeping away of the, of the ashes and those sort of things. Amen? It's letting God come down in with the word into that subconscious as you're being born again he's reprogramming he's reprogramming the subconscious he's reprogramming it with that that's true that's that's sincere that's his full truth amen no hypocrisy to it it's pure it's clean and uh, when he gets through then what happens to the corruption it's gone so now it's what incorruption this mortal must put on incorruption. Amen? I know I don't have time to go into Corinthians 15, but I'd sure like to. <laughs> Praise God. But I wanted to break it down, make it to where you really fully understood it. And I found in, by going in the concordance to look up the word sincere, that it, uh, it was just partially, the, 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 uh, the dictionary was a much better fullness of the descriptive of the word, but it says the same thing in the concordance, amen, in the, in the Greek word. Praise God. I'm going to wind up here. I'm still in the, uh, in the second chapter of 1 Peter. I'm going to wind it up. Wherefore also, sixth verse, it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion for a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded or confused. He makes it simple. Doesn't bring it to where it's so confusing. Amen? <coughs> He'll deal with whatever error they might be in us. Whatever we might believe that is not truly of him, he'll deal with it. Amen? But you've got to let him do it. Unto you, therefore, which believe that he is precious, but unto them which the be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But you, you, as a chosen generation, amen, and a royal priesthood, a holy nation of uh, 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 peculiar people. Look the word peculiar up, and you'll find it means very, very, very special. Amen? In the Greek. A, a, a special, a, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness, Kedar, into his marvelous light. Where you once were in darkness, you're now in the light. Amen? Amen. You're now in the light. Praise God. Which in times past were not a people, but, but now, but are now the people of God which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims abstain from fleshly desires which war against the soul. Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles or the nations that whereof they speak against you with evil do as evildoers, they, they may by your good works which you shall and, shall behold, and they shall behold glorify God in the day of visitation. Praise God. God bless you tonight. Uh, anything you want to add, sir? Brother Chuck Wallace, our pastor.
There's a lot of things I could share on, but, but I'm not uh, going to take that much time. But in experience, we are birthed many times. But when the Word of God first made its entrance into us, and that Word of God forever altered the course of our life, it was at that time we became a divine being, a new creature. Old things were passed away. The person we once were was nailed to Calvary's cross. Now, that all happens when the Word of God starts working inside of us. From that point, we are a new creature. Amen? However, it takes a whole learning process to come to the understanding that who we once were was crucified. And I was thinking as he was giving many of these different uh, definitions, I was thinking about what has been programmed inside the natural mind is to believe what we see. To walk by sight. But the new creation man does not walk by sight. He walks by faith. He walks by faith. And faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So when we hear the Word of God, and we believe the Word of God, we begin a reprogramming of the mind. And the more that we receive the Word of God, the more it goes into our subconscious. When we're hearing it, it goes into our conscious mind. But as we continue to hear it, as we continue to read, as we meditate upon it, and more importantly, as we begin to act upon it, it becomes a part of our subconscious mind. And so, the conscious mind, the natural mind, let me say it that way, not the natural mind, that which had been programmed because of the old guy that we once were, he looks at what his flesh wants, and he thinks that's what he wants. How many know there's a difference between you and the flesh? You don't know that until the Word of God starts coming into your, to your life, and you start seeing a whole other part of you. Because until the Word of God come into our life, this is all we had to deal with. This is what we thought we were. So if our flesh wanted it, we think we want it. Oh, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And we have religious ideas from the mind of man that had been programmed into us that tell us that we're different from God. But he that is born again, he that is born of God is what his father is. So what God is, is what we are. Either that or we're not born again. If we're born again, we are what our father is. So what he wants is really what we want. But it takes a lifetime of discovery for that. But the, the natural mind tells us we can never be like God. So consequently, we can never really be patient. Because, let's face it, humanity isn't patient. The flesh isn't patient. But let me tell you something. I'm not the flesh. I believe who God says I am. And as I begin to believe who God says I am, you know what starts coming out of me? P 
patience. It's time we take our tongue and we line it up with the Word of God. I am not a sinner anymore. I was a sinner. I sinned and came short of the glory of God. But Jesus' death on Calvary's cross forgave my transgression. But more than that, he took the sinner that I was and nailed it to Calvary's cross, and I am born again of that same nature he's of. Now, does that mean that, that I never sin? It means I have the ability to never sin. But I miss the mark, same as anyone else at times, only because I get my eyes off of the Word of God, off of who He says I am. And I begin to believe things that are deceitful. And some of those things could be religious thoughts that have been programmed inside of us that tells us, well, after all, we're only human. Not true. After all, we're just sinners saved by grace. But we're just, no, the sinner died on Calvary's cross. He who knew no sin became sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. According to the word of God, we're the righteousness of God. Oh, hallelujah. So I can be patient. I can be like God. I can live without sin. I do not have to yield my members over to the lusts of the flesh. I can control them. It is who and what I am. Now, unfortunately, it takes a while before we fully believe that. But the more we believe that and the more that goes into our subconscious, the more it comes back in our actions, in our words. Until we quit talking the way religion talks, quit talking the way humanity talks, say, after all, I'm only human. No, I'm not. I'm divine. I'm divine. I've been born again of an incorruptible nature, an incorruptible word. And honey, that which is still able to be corrupted is going to be changed by the incorruption that I am as my words begin to line up with his word instead of what I see with my natural mind. Is this making sense? Oh, praise the Lord. And so I was just thinking of all that as he was speaking that. And I know he, he eloquently brought a lot of that out. But it's where we begin to quit going by what religion has taught us. Quit going by what we see. Yeah, I can see a lot of faults in my life. How many can see some faults in your life? But are those faults really you? Or are they the things that have been programmed in here? If they're the things that were programmed in here, how many know we're going through a reprogramming? As we are programmed with the Word of God, we're going to find out those faults more and more are going to come underneath our feet. And we can be like Him in every area. In fact, the Word says, as He is, so are we in this present world. Not one day we're going to be like him. Right now we are like him. And as we begin to believe that, how many know it's going to affect our thoughts? It's going to affect our attitudes. It's going to affect our behavior. Praise the Lord. All right, give him a hand. Praise God. I just want to bring one more thing as a follow-up. Since he followed up, I'm going to follow up. I want you to see the simplicity of how God made things. What you sow is what you reap. Amen. If you sow the good seed, you're going to reap the good. But if you sow the bad seed, oops, you, you're going to reap the bad. And if you sow error, what you think the Word says, Instead of finding out and letting God reveal himself to you, he said, I, 
I would, I would that you would uh, uh, learn true wisdom. And uh, you need to be given the spirit of the spirit of wisdom in the knowledge of Him. The spirit of wisdom in the knowledge of Him. So you need to receive the gift of the spirit of wisdom that reveals Him. Amen. Amen. And uh, and 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 as and as you learn that your tongue sows seed depends on what you're bringing out with that false tongue. If it's a false tongue and it's an arrow, it's bringing out false doctrines. You need to check and recheck everything you're preaching or you think is truth. Go to the concordance. Look into the original Hebrew, the original Greek, because you've got to have true wisdom with the knowledge. You take knowledge without the wisdom, you become dangerous. You're not so in love. You're sowing discourse and hypocrisy. Amen? It's that simple fact. Sowing and reaping. Amen? Now, I'll tell you one thing else, too. You've got a lot of instructors out there. You turn on the television, turn on the radio, you've got a lot of instructors. But you don't have very many fathers. A true father knows how to take that son or that daughter, especially the son, because in, in him there's neither male nor female, so it's sonship, and train them up in how to operate his business. Amen? And if his business is spreading the gospel and the good news, then, uh, brother, what comes out of your and sister, what comes out of your mouth has got to be good news. So the good news. He come that you might have life, and have it more abundantly. Amen? And that's what's going to come out of your mouth. And if we don't learn how to respect one another, and honor one another, and respect one another, because we are of Him, deity. We are of Him in spirit. He that's joined unto the Lord is what? One spirit. One spirit. If you're dualized, you, down in that subconscious, you've got to either, you, you, most people have a dual mind. And they've got they've got corruption there, and you can't bring fresh water and salt water out of the same fountain. It's either got to be good clear water, or it's got to be salt water. You got to look at what's coming out of your mouth. Amen? Amen. But God has given the answer, and the secret, and revealed it of how He can deal with a false tongue. But you've got to let Him. Amen. Anybody got a prayer request tonight?